Okay. So this is terminology and key numbers. Uh, and so that's a big chapter um, where I have uh, made my own uh, uh, drawings and figures. Um, some of them are hand drawn, and some I have had the time to uh, to uh, draw them in uh, Illustrator. Uh, but so it's not completely uh, it's not completely finished, um, and so you may see some of my um, hand drawings. So so that's how we uh, how we are go going to do. And in this chapter, uh, basically, we are going to go uh, to describe the different segments of the source to sink system. So the source area, the transfer, and the basin. And then we will speak about the processes of erosion and sedimentation. And then uh, we will speak about the controls, tectonics, uh, and climate, basically, plus the autogenic uh, processes uh, that happen inside the system. And the last thing will be signal propagation. Okay, so I basically have a huge uh, program, and but some of it is not finished. And then after this, um, in, in this source to sink course. Um, I don't know if I will show you this or not, but maybe I, I will show you some elements of it. I've decided to uh, create some sort of cookbook, uh, livre de, de recette de cuisine. So the cookbook in this case is a, a list, a kind of a very, uh, um, telegraphic list of items um, that allow you to, to see, for instance, if you want to do a paleo elevation of a mountain range, what should you use? If you want to know the past drainage area of a, of a system, what should you use? If you want to estimate sediment flux, what should you use, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a cookbook with uh, different recipes uh, for, uh, for the source to sink approach. But first, yeah, we will go through source, transfer, basin, then processes, then controls, and then signal propagation. Um, so I should actually, um, I should actually write this outline somewhere, and I, I will uh, I will do it. Uh, and I should also correct this. So I should just do it now. Um, here it is. I mean, I don't know what you were seeing before. I was maybe looking at the different screen. Okay, so from source to sink, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now you have the plan. And I also cited this. Oh. So you were seeing my Word file. Um, now you can see the value may come. Okay, I should put this here. And this. Like that. Okay, I just wanted it in French. So sorry, Leonardo. Martina, I don't know what is your first uh, idiom? Italian, but I, okay. I speak a bit of French. It's more or less the same, yeah? Yeah. Um, so I wrote, I mean, I, I copied these sentences here. Um, Qu'importe la quantité quand la qualité reste manifeste, uh, Qu'importe même l'ensemble des qualités quand certaines qualités restent caractéristiques, l'analyse causale est fondée sur une hiérarchie évidente des qualités et pour cette analyse, la détermination de la quantité est de peu d'intérêt. And this is in a book by Gaston Bachelard, who is a, a philosopher, a epistemologist, 
uh, and especially of science. Uh, and the book is Le Nouvel Esprit Scientifique. You can find it in the Presse Universitaire de France. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's just to say that in addition to your scientific reading, you should also, also read if you can, uh, if, you, if you find the time, but I think you should find the time to read about uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of books that sh show you the different approaches to science. Uh, and so here, for instance, le savant ne mesure pas toujours Il tâche d'abord de saisir la correspondance des phénomènes et il pense souvent cette correspondance sans en mesurer toutes les variations. So, ou c'est dans la liaison de signe à signe, plus souvent que dans la liaison de nombre à nombre, qu'il trouve les leçons premières du déterminisme. Think about a geologist on the field. A geologist on the field does exactly that. You know, you link different, different observations signe à signe, you, you link observation, you link the signs, and you infer a causal relationship, okay? You see, uh, you see a trust, you see a fold, you say that bo both of them are linked, and they must be, you, you, you see them in the Alps, uh, you see their orientation, you link them with the techniques of the Alps, okay? You don't need to go and measure the fold axis. You don't need to go and measure the fold curvature. Okay, you don't need to go and find the age of the rocks to do that. You can, you can already do a, a causal analysis in your work based on simple observations. Okay. Uh, so here, Bachelard was arguing that Quantifying, quantification is not always necessary. That, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the quantity, when the quality remains man manifest. And that for the causal analysis, la determination de la quantité, determining quantity is of little interest. And that's very, uh, contradictory with the current thinking that we have in geology. In fact, at the moment, everything should be quantified. You should have numbers for everything. It's not enough to determine, uh, to determine uh, qualities, to determine characteristic. Okay, you need to quantify. And so I think Bachelard was, uh, for sure, he was uh, right and it's for sure, uh, much clever than, than, than us. But nowadays, what we see in geology is that it's important to have numbers because actually the numbers can tell you whether uh, a, a phenomena, a phenomenon is important or not for what you observe. Okay. Let me give you an example of this. Imagine, uh, um, Let's speak about let's speak about erosion and sediment transport in the um, uh, in a river. Let's say in the Rhone River in the Alps here. Um, if you do a, a very intense uh, storm for uh, so something really intense, like, a, like a, a, a hurricane, like a tropical typhoon, uh, like in America or these kind of things. You do a tropical typhoon, uh, so one meter of rain per, per hour in the Alps, in Valis. You do that for one minute. You're not going to you know, the quality is a tropical typhoon, but the quantity is one minute. It's not going to impact sediment supply. If you do it for one day, you will have so much rain that you will have flooding, sediment transport, you will have a massive landscape transformation. Okay? And if you do it for two days, even more. So, 
uh, the quality is important to know that in the past, for instance, there was periods with floods, periods with uh, drought, you know, no rain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But to know whether they are important or not, we still need to quantify. We still need to try to assess their uh, duration and their magnitude. Um, Okay, so that's an example of, uh, of uh, that's, that's one message I wanted to, to, to convey. Now, I want to speak about the source area. Um, and so I made this, uh, this drawing for you, for the Vademecum. Um, and I try to, to sketch uh, a maximum of things on this, uh, on this drawing uh, that I think are fundamental uh, for you to become source to sink uh, thinkers, source to sinkers. Um, and these are, these are things that we didn't use to teach in sedimentology at all. You know, 10 years ago, you will never hear about this in a sedimentology class, except if it was by Stanley Schum. Uh, but now it becomes absolutely common. We've made the link between geomorphology and sedimentology. And so, uh, so the main concept, one of the main concepts is the concept of, so here, sorry, you have a, it's one type of landscape, of tectonic landscape, where you have some sort of mountain and rock uplift. There is a trust fault here. So this is a, a cross section and this is a three dimensional view. I don't know if it's, if you see what I wanted to represent here. Um, and here you see half of a valley, you know, just one side of the valley with the main river inside. And here you see an entire valley. Okay, with both sides of the valley with a main river inside. And here you see another valley. You have climate and rainfall. So this falls onto the surface and this is collected by drainage areas or also known as catchments. They catch the water. And so they are limited by divides. This is the main divide of the mountain range. So every, every water that falls on that side of the mountain flows here. Everything that falls on the other side of the mountain will flow towards this side. And there is also a divide between valleys. So a droplet that falls here, exactly where my arrow is, will end up in this river and here at this outlet. A droplet that falls here will end up in this river, flow down here and end up at this outlet. Okay. So this is a drainage area or catchment or drainage basin. We also call it a basin. Uh, air de drainage, bassin de drainage. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the vocabulary uh, you should know for this, this, this part. Um, is that OK? We have a yes. note. Thank yes. You. Thank you, Betin. So we have another drawing of it here. Um, and I think, I think it's important if I go here, this is a plan view. It's a view from above. You have the basin outlet, you know, that's the, that's the exit of the drainage area. So all the water that falls onto this area ends up passing by here. Okay, if it is not evaporated. Inside, you have a main stream river and you have a tributary stream. You could have many tributaries, okay? A tributary is a, is a small, catch, a small uh, stream that comes into the main one. You could have, we could actually argue here, maybe this one is the main, and this one is the tributary, okay? I have to admit my drawing is not, uh, it's a little bit ambiguous here, but 
you know what I mean. You see here, you have a mainstream and several tributaries. Okay, so here you see the limit, the boundary of the catchment. Tributary, mainstream, mainstream, main river. You have the stream head or the, or the river head. Okay, that's the, that's where the river starts. In other words, it could be the source. Okay, so if you go uh, on a landscape, normally you should find a place where the river starts. Okay, it doesn't start as a river, it starts as a stream. Okay, but that's, that's something and it's actually it's actually fascinating to find, you know, there's, there is a lot of attempts to find the source of the Nile, the Nile River. Uh, of course, it's complicated to find the source of a big river. And you could argue, what is the source of this river? If you float here, is it here or is it here? You know, which one is the source? Which one is the main source? There's tons of definition for that, you know. The source is the one which feeds the longest stream. The source could be the one which feeds the, more, the stream with the biggest uh, debit discharge. Okay, so there is different uh, different uh, things, but clearly on the field you can go and try to find uh, the source. And often uh, I need to show you um, a picture, but often there is a distance between the head, uh, between the, sorry, the, the, the edge of the catchment, the, the boundary, the limit, and the beginning of the river incision or the stream incision. And this distance here is non-channelized. Here you have the channel head and everything above is non-channelized. Where it's non-channelized, you have what is called overland flow. Overland flow is ruissellement. Uh, it's just when the water uh, flows, but it flows, um, uh, it just flows uh, not making any, uh, not making any, uh, any channel. So it just flows at the surface like a nap. Okay, and you can see that in a in a field. Uh, sometimes you, you you go on a on a on a on a, on a steep uh, or a, or a field with a bit of inclination. You don't see one stream inside it. You have a what you have water flowing in between the, the 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 grass. A little bit of water everywhere. It's wet everywhere, and the water goes down. But by by going down, the water sometimes starts to you know it doesn't go straight. If it was going straight, it would never make a small river. At some point, two little, two little drops, they join. And when they join, they become more powerful and they continue faster. And then progressively they collect, they collect, they collect. And at some point, they are sufficiently powerful to start incision and start erosion. That's where you start a channel. Okay, so uh let me just uh do this uh what is uh, the amount of water that we need to uh to make an, uh, an incision an incision no, we don't know that ah okay no this is a big research question uh how much water you know it could depend on you can imagine a field it can depend on the amount of water, but it can also depend on the steepness. Mm -hmm. It can depend on the material to be eroded. Yes. Okay. It can depend on many, many uh, parameters. But if you look at channel head, I don't know if you see my screen. Well, channel head gives very strange result on the web. Uh, channel initiation. Uh, uh, sorry, image. 
um, there is tons of geomorphological work on this and it's really fascinating uh, but we we don't know the answer yet uh, I can just show you um, maybe this oh, okay um, Mm Okay, I, I am not going to lose too much time uh, trying to find uh, what I wanted to show you. I just have a... Ah, okay. It's because of the resolution, it's not super easy to do that. Okay, that's a great one. Where... Where do channels begin? Do you see my my uh, my screen with where do channels begin? Yeah. Yes. 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 So that's a very 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 cool paper, pure geomorphology by Montgomery and Dietrich. Uh, and uh, you see at, at what scale do channels begin? And and here you can see that uh, you see the. I mean, it's it's not so easy to say even on the field. But here it seems we have the head of the, of the channel somewhere there and the bow non, is non-channelized. Here it seems the same. We see, it seems like we have a channel here that begins and above there is nothing. Okay, so this is the kind of, uh, this is the kind of, uh, of question. It's not the best, it's not the best, uh, it's not the best uh, picture. You have to know that a lot of people studied that with numerical models, mathematical models in uh, agriculture. Because if you have a field that you, you labor, you know, when you, when you plow, plow P-L-O-U-G-H, that's my English, there, there are some words not easy to, to pronounce, but you know, uh, if you plow, plow a field, uh, that's this. This is plowing, okay? Uh, these are flat fields, but on um, inclined field, you know, you some agriculture, uh, some uh, farmers, they want to know when will channel initiate because they might end up in a river in their field. Okay, so it's quite important uh, to know how to plow correctly uh, if you don't want to increase uh, to increase uh, channel initiation. Okay. Um, and this distance is called the Horton distance um, because uh, um, Horton uh, was a research researcher in geomorphology at the beginning of the of the century, and he um, and he found that uh, there is a distance uh, before which channel really initiate. I I want to uh, continue just a little bit on uh, on this here uh, because I wanted to 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 draw here um, these two drawings, they are, they are different, the two of them. On this one, it's like I took the drainage area and I, and I look at it on the side, so it's, it's inclined. And the drainage area is the, this disc, this ellipse, with a black outline and a flux outside that goes out. And there is the main river inside. So it's a simplified view of this, okay? 
and here r big r is the rainfall and so what i represent here is the amount of rainfall uh, that falls on it and you see that if you multiply the drainage area by rainfall you get the outlet water discharge so uh, you can calculate the water flux the water discharge at the exit of a drainage basin by multiplying rainfall by drainage area you should normally subtract infiltration and evaporation some of the water infiltrates maybe 20 percent and some of the water evaporates okay actually some of it is also taken up by vegetation so you you have surely less water going out here uh, than what comes in by rainfall but if you are in a dry landscape in the desert or you know in somewhere like in the zagros in iran or actually in the mediterranean region why are uh, rainfall episodes so uh the cause of so many floods it's because the water does not infiltrate it's not taken up by vegetation and it doesn't evaporate much okay you are on dry catchment dry rock and everything that falls onto the catchment goes at the outlet and you get you get a flood okay in a more temperate uh english style uh catchment it's uh, not very steep. Uh, there is a lot of earth, uh, a lot of vegetation, and it's uh, so so you may have a less effective catchment at transferring water downstream. But this equation here, water discharge equals drainage area times rainfall, is very important. Okay, minus infiltration, minus uh, evaporation. I should add this onto the equation, but it's very important. And here is the same, but with erosion. You have your initial drainage area, which is now dashed. And let's say you erode with an erosion rate R of, with units of length divided by time. You know, the, the rate, also for the rain, you, you measure rain in millimeters per hour. It's not a volume. Okay, you transform rainfall rate in a volume by multiplying by drainage area, but rain is in millimeter per hour. When it rains, I, I ask you to put a glass outside in your garden or on your balcony. Okay, to measure how much rain was falling down, you just measure the height. Okay, and it doesn't matter whether you put a bucket or a glass you will have the same height. Okay. However, if you have a bucket, you will collect more rain because your area is bigger. But the height will be the same in the bucket and in the glass. Okay, so rainfall is measured in height per hour in, in unit of L length divided by time. And it's the same for erosion rate. Erosion rate is a vertical rate of erosion. So how much millimeters per year you erode. And so if you multiply this by drainage area, you have the sediment flux out of the basin, the erosive erosional sediment flux out of the basin. So sediment supply is drainage area times erosion rate. Okay. And yes. And it's in units of L cube divided by time. Time, L can be millimeter, meter, kilometer, whatever you want. And time can be second, minute, hours, years, million years, whatever you want. Okay, so this is for uh, those units of drainage area. Sorry, let me come back here. Um, Okay, now 
in each drainage area, you have to realize that 10% or 5% of the drainage area is occupied by rivers, channels, channelized, localized places where water flows, and 90% of the drainage area is occupied by hill slopes. Les versants. Okay. Okay. And hill slopes are areas where water is not channelized, where there is overland flow, but not only overland flow, there are other processes on hill slopes. But basically, they are diffusive processes. They are distributive processes. So these, I'm, I'm speaking about sediment transport processes. So they are processes that uh, distribute the sediment in a non-localized uh, manner. In the river, the sediment is transported with the water. Okay, it's like a tube, it's like a conveyor belt. Okay, it's just like a funnel, a channel for sediment and water, a river. But the hill slopes, the sediment, they go a little bit everywhere. Again, there is a massive literature on, sed on sediment transport on hill slopes. For instance, one is called the splash effect. The splash effect is when you have a drop of water falling down onto the earth, like the field I was showing you before. When the drop of water falls, a little bit of earth goes everywhere, you know, in all directions. Okay. If you are on a hill slope like this, the grains that go up, they will be brought down by the other droplets. But the grains that go down progressively, many, many splash effect on a, on a hill like this, make the grains go down to the river. Okay. okay. So the integrative, the integrated effect of all this little splash of little raindrops is making the, the grain of the earth go down and finish in the river. Another uh, process you know very well is landslides. I, I think, Betim, you did the excursion probably uh, with Marcus Stoffel in the Alps. Yes. In Honda, you've seen oh. You've seen the landslide uh, in Randa. You, you remember this huge, massive landslide? I so, think we saw a uh, uh, cone déboulé, je crois, ça. Oui, c'est ça. ça. C'est ça. So, okay. so basically, and this is a drawing you see here, I put landslide. It's like the whole, sometimes the, the slope is so steep that suddenly the whole, the whole side, the whole hill slope collapses. And of course, it goes down by gravity and it brings sediment to the river. Okay. Another process is creeping. C R E E. Creeping is just, you know, slow landsliding. You see, you see that sometimes when you walk in the Alps in the, in the fields, you see that the, the, the whole hill slope is going down slowly. You see the traces of this. Um, animals, when they walk, you've seen uh, fields in the Alps, you see this kind of path of uh, animals, of cows, okay? The cows is the same. When they walk, they bring a little bit of earth down. And the integrated effect of that is to bring the sediment down, okay? So the hill slope processes are very important because they are 90% of the erosional processes uh, of a catchment. Then uh, they bring sediment ultimately to the river. So the river then is localized and has to be efficient to transport all this sediment. Um, so we have mainstream, hill slope. Another word for hill slope is interfluve because it's all the surface in between fluves. A fluve will be a channel. Uh, I said basin outlet. Um, here, uh, what we have in addition uh, is a characterization of the shape of drainage 
basins. You have this here. Okay. What I try to show is two different diagrams. In this diagram, we have a drainage basin in blue. And, you know, each little stream in this drainage basin has its own drainage area. You know, there is the big drainage area, but each one of them has its own drainage area. Okay. And so if I look and I zoom onto the drainage area of this one, I find the same, sorry, I find the same shape as a big basin. So this is self-similar drainage basins, is that the drainage basin, they all look the same independently of the scale at which you look. So that's called Hack's law, interbasins Hack's law, because it's, it's, it's when you look at different basins worldwide and you can find a relationship between the length of a basin and the drainage area. And basically the, the relationship is L of a basin, the length is equal to 1.7 times drainage area exponent 0.5. There is a mistake here, it's exponent 0.5. So square root of drainage area. So basically, if you know the length of a basin, you can, you can assume its drainage area. So that's quite, uh, that's quite interesting if you think about reconstructing past uh, drainage systems. Sometimes, however, um, um, drainage basins do not grow in a self-similar way. Uh, sometimes when you look at small basins, they are different than big basins. So if I look at this small, in this case here, I have an allometric scaling in which actually the small basins are a little bit large and the big basins are more elongate. And in this case, both the coefficient here and the exponent here are different than this one. 0.5 is self-similar. Big basins look like small basins. 0.6 is when big basins are less elongate than big, sorry, is when small basins are uh, less elongate than big basins. So big basins are more and more and more elongated. And um, 0.4 would be small basins more elongate than big basins. But this, these two laws are the two ones that they are the two most general. This one is for comparing different basins worldwide. If you compare all the basins of the globe, you find this. And if you look only within a basin, often the small basins within a basin are less elongate than the big basin. Okay, so this gives you uh, lows, a little bit like I was speaking before for the ratio between slope, fan area, uh, you know, the different proportions. Here is a proportion of, of, of uh, the drainage areas and streams. Um, Okay, another important pattern, uh, a new, another important parameter is here. Uh, it's the, in the case of a mountain range, you can look at the spacing between outlets at the mountain front. And the spacing between outlets at the mountain front is proportional to the basin length. In general, it's about half of the basin length. So if you go in the mountain ranges, like, uh, like in the Pyrenees, for instance, and I can come back here, and you have 
two alluvial fans with their apex here. You can measure the distance between the apex, and this gives you the outlet spacing. So this gives you, you just multiply by two, and you have an idea of the distance from here to the main divide of the mountain range. And you also get an idea of the drainage area, because if you have this distance, which is half of the basin width, and this distance, which is length of the basin, you multiply length by this, by basin width, and, and you have the drainage area. Okay, so I'm almost finished and I need to, I need to run because otherwise I will, uh, I will miss um, to pick up my uh, daughter. But um, what I wanted to say, what I wanted to say here, uh, ah, yes. The, another very important thing is the shape of these rivers here. And there is two different type of rivers. The rivers here, they are bedrock rivers, meaning they flow. And even if there is sediment coming from the side, they evacuate the sediment such that they flow on a clean bedrock. They take the sediment and they take it out. Basically, you can see the rock being eroded at the bottom of the river. Whereas here in the basin, the bottom of the rivers is made of sediment. It's covered with sediment. Okay, these are alluvial rivers. So these are bedrock rivers. The bed of the river is made of rock. And here these are alluvial rivers. The bed of the river is made of alluvium, sediment. And this gives two very different, in general, this gives two very different because of processes that we will see later. This will give two very different river profiles. If you look at the elevation profile with distance, bedrock river profiles are concave. You know, they are steep here close to the source and they become less and less steep as you go towards the outlet. And alluvial river profile are much more gentle slope and linear. Also, in the mountains, often you have a nick point. A nick point is, a, is an inflection point on the river profile. And the nick point is usually the trace of a past tectonic event or base level fall. And you can have river terraces. OK, alluvial terraces on the side. And these are all geomorphological markers that we can interpret in terms of landscape evolution. A nick point can also be just due to lithology. Things about the Niagara Falls. OK, the Chute du Niagara. Uh, this will be a nick point. You have a profile, you have a fall, a waterfall, and then another profile above. Uh, and that's a lithological profile, but it's not always the case. And it's all, also not always as dramatic as uh, the Niagara Falls or the Victoria Falls. Uh, sometimes it's just a little cascade. Uh, okay, I, I think this was quite uh, intense, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's good. Uh, you've, uh, hopefully you've learned a lot. Uh, good luck for translating this into a, into a report. Uh, but I think you, at least in the process, you, you learn a lot. And so tomorrow we will continue. Uh, maybe a good news for you is that for organizational purpose, again, uh, kids dropping, uh, life, of, uh, life of family, I need to start. I can only start at 10.15 at, uh, tomorrow because I won't make it uh, on time. And so uh, let's not start at 9.30 or 9.45. Let's just start at 10.15. All right. Okay. And the day three until five as usual. Uh, but my hope is to finish before because I have, a, I have a lot to do. And normally, but normally it should be.